Okay, well, uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're at. Um, I have 10 o'clock, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is David Castor with uh, Easy Power, and uh, we're, our webinar today is going to be discussing uh, doing equipment duty calculations, and we're going to be focusing on low voltage equipment here, and we have a just a half hour, 30 minute session scheduled. So, um, so we'll focus on low voltage equipment, and we're going to talk about the relationship between um, equipment duty and the short circuit calculations, and how you and t take a look at the reports in Easy Power that you can generate and what you can see on the one line. So, um, if you look down below there on the uh, slide, you should be able to see the typical equipment duty report that Easy Power puts out. And uh, this is for low voltage. This particular bus is a 480 volt bus. So we're going to go through and uh, discuss where these values come from and how they're calculated and why they're different sometimes from the, the normal short circuit calculations. But first, let's talk about why um, we care about equipment duty, because if we get to so much emphasis today on arc flash, we tend to forget about uh, taking a look at the equipment rating, short circuit ratings of our circuit breakers and fuses. And really that's equally important to doing the arc flash calculations. And because the equipment's only rated up to a certain value of fault current. And our expectation is that when we apply these circuit breakers and fuses, they're going to be able to interrupt whatever the maximum short circuit current is that they're going to be subjected to if there's a, a fault downstream of them. So um, it's, it's very important to take a look at equipment duty uh, because the equipment can fail uh, rather catastrophically sometimes in exciting ways. Uh, so it can cause equipment damage, fires, and in the worst case, uh, injuries. And also, obviously, if you're relying on this breaker to protect someone downstream from an arc flash hazard, the breaker needs to be able to operate properly to provide that protection. So if your arc flash calculation is dependent on an underrated circuit breaker up there, then uh, you have a significant issue. Uh, there are references in the National Electrical Code that discuss the equip equipment interrupting ratings and also equipment short circuit ratings. Um, so I'm not going to get into the details of it, but basically, you have to understand that if you have an underrated circuit breaker or fuse or switch or anything else that's not adequate for the short circuit that it could be subjected to, that is an NEC violation. So that's a legal issue that you have to deal with. Uh, so it's a significant matter. So we have some terminology we'll talk about. Uh, sometimes it gets a little confusing when we throw these terms around. Uh, but just as a little review, um, we talk about equipment duty. That's related to the equipment as it's installed in your system. And that's the maximum short circuit current that that particular device will be subjected to in a particular place in your system after any necessary adjustment factors are applied. And we'll talk about why we might need, need to apply adjustment factors here in a minute. Now, the equipment rating, on the other hand, that's what's printed on the side of the breaker when you buy it. That's the maximum short circuit current that the device is rated for. So this is a basic function of the device. So whether it's sitting on the shelf or no matter where it's installed or who buys it, it has a certain short circuit rating, and that never changes. So the duty will vary depending on the application, but the rating does not vary for a particular voltage. And for a particular device, it's, it has a, a listed rating. And ultimately, these equipment ratings are determined by short circuit tests by the manufacturer. So they have to prove that it can interrupt a certain magnitude of fault current. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. All right, one thing that uh, I have run into over the years, particularly with people supplying package systems, uh, the size of the breaker, the amp continuous current rating, is not really 
a factor in determining its short circuit rating. Um, so if I have a bus that I have 42,000 amps available on that 480 volt, which is an increasingly common, it doesn't matter if I have a 20 amp breaker or a 2,000 amp breaker. They both are going to have to be able to withstand the 42,000 amp fault current. So that there's no uh, difference really there. Uh, might even be worse for the 20 amp because of the way it's tested, but that's in general the actual amp rating, continuous current rating, does does not have any impact on the fault current. The fault current is determined by your system, the transformer size and cable lengths and those kind of things. So, so another some other terms that get thrown around is we talk about a piece of equipment being underrated or overdutied. Those two things. Those are really equivalent terms in my mind. Um, anytime you have a calculated equipment duty that exceeds the device rating, that device is underrated or it's overduty. Those one or the other. So you can use whatever term you like the best. All right. So in Easy Power, one of the main things we do after we build a model, we can calculate the short circuit current. Uh, we have our half cycle and five cycle and 30 cycle and all that. So if we calculate the maximum half cycle fault current at a bus, shouldn't that be sufficient to determine the equipment duty and the short circuit ratings of the equipment? And so the answer is that's not quite enough. Uh, it's the first step. We have to know the fault current, symmetrical fault current. But as our equipment duty starts to approach the breaker rating or the fuse rating, there's another factor that we have to take into account, and that's the asymmetrical fault current. And we'll talk about what we mean by that. If you look at this slide over here on the left, this is, uh, this is a symmetrical sine wave. So if this is my, if you can imagine this being your fault current, you can see that the magnitude of the sine wave is equal above and below the zero axis. Okay, so it's symmetrical in, from the standpoint that the magnitudes are the same above and below the zero axis. So that's our normal condition, right? That's when everything is in the steady state condition. We're going to have typically have a symmetrical sine wave here. Now, if we look at this example, we have the same peak-to-peak -peak magnitude, but if you look closely, you'll see this sine wave is totally displaced. So what was the zero point is now one per unit, and the bottom of this minor peak here is zero. So that's this is what we call fully offset. All right. Now. Even though the peak-to-peak -peak value is the same, the RMS values are different. So here is, for my symmetrical sine wave, here's the RMS value. That's our familiar 0 0.707 times the, the peak value here, right? But if I look at my asymmetrical fully offset curve, then my RMS value is above 1 here. So this is effectively a higher value of current. We have a higher RMS current, which generates more heat. You can also look at my peak current. It's all the way up to 2. Or here my peak was 1. So this has a higher peak current, and that becomes a concern for the circuit breakers because that's how they're rated. And that determines how much current I can interrupt in a breaker is the peak current. So this asymmetrical current is caused by the inductance in our circuit. When we have a fault, we cannot change the magnitude of current instantaneously. So um, we get situations, depending on the phase angle, we get situations where this current is going to be offset like this. Another way to think about asymmetrical current is I could take a symmetrical current and I could add a DC component and sum those two together, and that was going to leave me with this asymmetrical current. So in this case, if I have this symmetrical sine wave magnitude peak of 1, and I added in a DC current of magnitude 1, 
if I sum those together, I'm going to end up with this sine wave here. All right. So we make use of that way of thinking about the asymmetrical current when we look at our typical asymmetrical values and fault currents. So if my circuit was purely inductance and I had a fault, uh, I could end up with an offset wave like this that would never decay. The decay is due to the resistance in the circuit. So in the real world, when we have a fault, we get a sine wave that looks something like this. So here's my DC component we mentioned, right? So instead of being a constant, because of the resistance, it's going to decay. So I end up with a total fault current here that's the sum of the symmetrical fault current and this DC component. So it's going to start out very high, and then it's going to get smaller magnitude and more symmetrical as this decays over time. All right. So a couple things to remember is that the peak current is always the first half cycle. The other thing, we always draw this with the peak on the positive side. It could easily be on the negative side. It doesn't change anything. It just depends on when the fault occurs, right? Okay, so we're looking at the total fault current, and we're interested in this peak value. So that's going to determine, at the end of the day, what our breaker is capable of interrupting. Okay. So what determines this DC offset? Well, it's basically based on the X over R ratio of your system. So if, if I fault any particular location, I'm going to have an equivalent impedance looking back into the system. It's going to be, we're going to ignore the capacitance for now. It's usually not a factor for a typical power system faults. So we have resistance and we have inductive reactance. So the amount of the DC offset and the, the amount of the, the speed at which it decays depends on two things, really. This X over R ratio. So the higher the X over R ratio, the slower the system's going to de the DC current's going to decay. And the second thing it depends on is the actual voltage phase angle when the fault occurs. And that's because in a steady state condition, we have an inductive circuit. What happens to the current, right? It's going to lag the voltage, right? So Eli the Iceman, if you can remember back that far. So in a purely inductive circuit, the current lags the voltage by 90 degrees. And so in this short transient period, what happens to the current depends on what the voltage is when the fault occurs. But we don't get to pick that, and it's going to be different in all three phases, so we have to look at the worst case, right? All right, so if we look at X over R ratio, this is how fast, this is my DC offset current, and this determines the amount of asymmetrical current and how long it lasts. And this is in cycles down here, just to give you a point of a reference. So if I have an X over R ratio of, say, 1, that asymmetrical current is going to die out extremely fast, and it doesn't start, doesn't ever get terribly high, right? But if my X over R ratio is 20, then you're going to see this dies out much more slowly, and my resulting peak is going to be higher. That first peak is going to be higher, right? So, so another way of saying high X over R ratio is that it's a low power factor, right? It has a high X, a low R. That gives me a, a lousy power factor. So if you need to convert between power factor and X over R ratio, you can do it this way. All right. So that's the X over R ratio. Ratio. Now let's look at the impact of the voltage phase angle, okay, when the fault occurs. If, if this is my voltage, this solid line, 
and the dashed line is my current. At steady state, the, in an inductive circuit like this, the current wants to lag the voltage by 90 degrees. Okay. So if my fault occurs at peak voltage and my current can't change instantaneously anyway, it's just going to start basically in a steady state condition. So it can start at zero because the voltage is at peak and it wants to lag. So I get a nice symmetrical sine wave. Okay. So in terms of asymmetrical current, you'll get the least asymmetrical current if the fault occurs at the voltage peak. It's a little counterintuitive, but that's the way it works out because of the phase shift between the current and the voltage. All right. Now, if my fault occurs at zero voltage, remember my current cannot, uh, my steady state current wants to lag the voltage, right? But I have to start at volt current zero because of the inductance. So what happens is I get this offset wave here, this current wave. That's why actually having the fault at zero voltage point is gives me the maximum asymmetry, okay? So this is what we're going to be looking at as a worst case in terms of this peak value here. But again, we don't know when the fault's going to occur, so we have to assume a worst case. All right. So going back to this, uh, here we have an X over R ratio of only two, so my current's decaying pretty fast. There's one cycle that's pretty much gone, right? And by one and a half cycles, it's gone. So just trying to illustrate here that this peak current is always going to occur at this first peak here. This will be the highest value, and this is what we base our breaker ratings on. And so the higher the X over R ratio, the slower that decay is, pushes this peak higher. Okay, So that makes the breaker's job harder, and there's more heat generated. Okay, because this decay is occurring even before the first peak. All right, so now that we kind of have a, we've discussed the asymmetrical current, we can talk about how that affects the circuit breaker ratings and how we deal with that in the program and what Easy Power does for us. So we're going to focus on low voltage circuit breakers and and how they're actually tested and rated. We're going to focus on breakers because the fuses, pretty much any low voltage fuse you use today is going to be current limiting, and they typically have very high short circuit ratings. So it's generally not an issue with current limiting fuses. If you have 100,000 amps, 200,000 amps of bulk current or interrupting rating, or short circuit rating. But they do have a similar test process and methodologies similar for both. Okay. Now, when you buy a breaker, or you're specifying a breaker, you specify it with, say, 22,000 amps short circuit current. And if you look at the fine print, it's going to say 22,000 amps RMS symmetrical, right? That's how it's rated. That's how it's stated when you buy the breaker. And that's for supposedly simplicity. It makes life easier for the people buying the breakers. But the reality is that the Breaker is actually rated based on the peak current. And again, going back to our little graph here, that peak current is this current right here. So that's what we're trying to figure out. So the breaker is, in reality, tested to a certain peak value. Then once they know that, they're going to establish the symmetrical rating by calculating the equivalent symmetrical current that would cause that peak. But to do that, they have to assume an X over R ratio. And that's the maximum X over R ratio that that symmetrical current, symmetrical rating is good for. And that's how it's tested. That's the test X over R. And this X over R ratio that it, they use for tests depends on the type of breaker, the rating at the size of the breaker, and the type of equipment. And so there's differing test protocols depending on the type of equipment and the test, whether it's 
the UL or NEMA or whoever is doing the testing or IEC, they're all a little bit different. So ultimately, they figure out the peak and then they work backwards to come up with a symmetrical rating. It's the best way to look at it. So here are the test X over R ratios that are used. And again, this is based on peak current. The peak is this, the peak value of the sine wave, first half cycle. So if you think about it, working backwards, the higher this test X over R, the higher the peak current for the same value of symmetrical current, right? So if I look at low voltage power circuit breakers, it's test X over R is 6.59. And this peak multiplier is what I would have to multiply the the RMS symmetrical rating to by to calculate the actual peak current that it can handle. So if I look at multi-case circuit breakers greater than 20,000 amps, basically they, they can be tested down to 4.9 X over R. That peak multiplier is lower, 2.1834. So what that means is if I have a 42,000 amp low voltage power circuit breaker and a 42,000 amp multi case circuit breaker. Those are symmetrical currents. The actual peak currents that they can handle is going to be different. And if I multiply the 42,000 by 2.3, that's a bigger number than the 42,000 times 2.1. So even though these both may say 42,000, the low voltage power circuit breaker is a more capable device in terms of fault current interruption. Now if you have a system where the X over R ratio never exceeds 4.9, then that's kind of a moot point. But uh, a lot of systems, industrial systems, will have X over R ratios considerably higher than this. And we see as, as the breaker ratings get smaller, the interrupting ratings, then the test requirements get lower. The X over R test gets lower. Based on where these are typically applied in systems, they're trying to come up with the value of the X over R that's consistent with how these are normally applied in, in the overall, you know, electrical systems in use throughout the country. Okay, so the bottom line is if we have a X over R ratio that's calculated at our fault point that exceeds that test value, the breaker has to be derated because the peak current will be higher than the peak current that was tested. So the way that the derating is done is we increase the breaker duty and we still express as RMS symmetrical to compare to the rating symmetrical. So basically we're putting it back on an equivalent basis. The way that that adjustment is done is because we know the X over R ratio at the fault point, we can, there's an equation, we can calculate the peak current for that particular X over R ratio. We divide that by the test peak current, multiply the symmetrical rating, the 22,000, 42,000 amps by that number, and we come up with an adjusted duty, okay? So when we show the duty in easy power, that's typically already been adjusted if that's necessary. Okay. If this fault peak is less than the test peak, we don't reduce the rating, right? It never goes down. The duty doesn't go below whatever it's tested for. This is only where it exceeds, X over R exceeds the test X over R. All right, so finally we can talk about the equipment duty and easy power, and that's gonna be done in short circuit. Uh, it really shows up in two places in the easy power and that is in the typical short circuit report and in the equipment duty report as a separate report. Now for low voltage equipment below 1,000 volts, we only are interested in the half cycle momentary fault network. Okay, the five cycle interrupting is really only applies to medium voltage and high voltage breakers because these typically these low voltage breakers are going to start to interrupt very quickly at high levels of fault current. So. The breaker only has a moment, a short time, a momentary half cycle rating. 
Okay. So here is my short circuit report. This is a half cycle momentary report. It should look somewhat familiar. So here's my bus. Here's my symmetrical short circuit amps. This is what's going to show up on your one line. Here's the X over R ratio. And here is the asymmetrical current. It's still an RMS, but basically based on this X over R ratio, this is a maximum offset value of 42,200 amps. Okay. Over here, this column is the equipment duties. Okay, so for each type of equipment, I have a different duty, potentially, because each one of these is tested at a different X over R ratio. If we see low voltage power circuit breaker, the duty is exactly the same as my symmetrical amps. That's because the low voltage power circuit breaker was tested at a higher value of X over R than the actual. If I go down to my, jump down to the bottom here, molded case circuit breakers with greater than 20,000 amps, this 33,000 amps, 33,200 is greater than the calculated symmetrical current. That's because the test X over R is lit, was like 4.9, right? Possibly. That's less than the actual X over R, so we have to adjust derate this breaker, and we derate it by increasing the duty amps that we're comparing to the rating, okay? So that's where these different numbers come from. The duty amps here listed here are going to reflect any required adjustment due to X over R ratio, but this will never be less than the symmetrical amps. Now the other thing to keep in mind in the short circuit report, this is the total bus fault current. Okay. Now in the real world, the current through any individual breaker may not be the same as the total bus fault current. And typically it's going to be le can often be less. So that is this gives you kind of a worst case. So if you purchased a breaker based on these ratings, you would be conservative. If you're trying to evaluate an existing breaker, we have a more accurate way to, to do that, and that's the equipment duty report. All right, so in the short circuit reports, those different values of duty that were listed are based on the options you select here. So I got the fuse duties, and I got the molded case circuit breaker duties in that last report because I checked these boxes. Down here is where we tell it to create the equipment duty report. And we'll look at that next. All right. So here we see the equipment duty report for low voltage. It's actually the same report format for high voltage, but this is simpler. So we have the equipment the, by bus. We have the equipment ID for each breaker. Then we have breaker information, test standard. ANSI symmetrical, and here's the rating, 65,000 amp symmetrical. Here's the duty, 67,805. 4.3% over its rating. That's a problem, right? Down here, we have 65,000 amps again, 64,343. So that's 1% under its rating. The minus percentage indicates it's below its rating. So we only get a warning for that one, all right? So this is basically comparing the rating, what's on the breaker, to what we calculated for the duty. Now, all that derating adjustments, that's all hidden here. We, we don't show that. We just give you the effective duty after any adjustments are made, if necessary, okay? So we're comparing the half cycle to the half cycle. That's, that's all there is for low voltage. But you'll see, even though these are all in the same bus, these duties are different, right? So let's take a look. Now, we, it could be different because different X over R test data, but these breakers are all the same. So they all are tested to the same X over R ratio. So this difference is due to the fact that they don't all see the same fault current. 
So if I can figure out how to do this, I'm going to go back and we'll take a look at an actual easy power example here. We're running a little late, so bear with me. We're getting close. So I go to short circuit. We're going to look at this switchgear bus here. And if I look at my half cycle, we're going to see Here's my total fault current that looks familiar. You guys are probably used to looking at these. These are my motor contributions. I've got my tiebreaker closed, so I have some additional current coming back through here. So 65,700 amps, my total bus fault current. But none of these breakers ever see exactly 65,700 amps. They all see something less than that. Right? So what we do in the equipment duty calculation, we call it our smart duty feature we actually determine the maximum current through each device and use that maximum current to determine the, the breaker duty. And that's why you'll see different values of, of duty amps, even though the breakers are all on the same bus. And if you want to look at this on the one line, the equipment duty, we have this choice up here, equipment duty. Now all I see are these percentages and the breakers turn red, which is usually a bad thing. So you notice it's only going to give you a report if the breaker is within 10% or whatever you set as a threshold, within 10% of its rating, which is the minus sign, or it's over its rating, which is like this one. Okay. The main breaker and the tie breaker are not, they're okay. They have a higher rating, actually, so they don't turn red here. They don't, we don't give you any information on the one line. If I want to look at my equipment duty report, if I go to short circuit reports, I would check this box. You can look at all the devices or only the ones in violation or warning. And there's a couple different levels of detail you can look at. So here's my report for that same bus, right? So even though they're all in the same bus and the total bus fall current is going to be the same for all of them, the calculated duty using smart duty is slightly different. Right? It finds the maximum current through that breaker rather than using the, just the total bus fault current. So the equipment duty calculation is going to be more accurate than using the bus, the short circuit duty listed in the short circuit report. Okay. One other thing I wanted to show you. Um, If you're looking at um, a device, I'm going to look at this high voltage breaker here just as an example. If I do an equipment duty report and it turns red but there's no percentage listed, that means there's no data. So I have no data here. It's a short circuit data. So Easy Power doesn't know how to, what to do with it. So it makes it turn red, but it doesn't, doesn't mean it's actually a problem. It's just saying it doesn't have enough information there. Okay. All right, so let's go back to my uh, PowerPoint here. Okay, a couple more slides. We looked at this already. This is how you turn on or off the equipment duty report in Easy Power. And you can select seeing all the devices or typically for a big system, you may only want to look at those devices that are over their rating or with getting close to their rating. All right, so just to summarize, the, we said at the, at the top that your arc flash results are not valid if the upstream device is not capable of interrupting the maximum fault current it can see. That's kind of the, the main thing to remember if you're, even if you're highly focused on arc flash calcs. The equipment duty should be a part of everything that you do, really. And uh, anytime you do an arc flash or short circuit study, you need to do that equipment duty calc. If you're doing arc flash, you've already entered all that breaker data anyway. So you might as well go ahead and run the equipment duty calc. And if you find underrated equipment, you need to make people aware of that because that's a significant issue, a potential safety hazard. All right, so sorry you ran a little bit long. Um, if you guys have questions, uh, just email me at david at easypower.com. And I wanted to mention that what we've been talking about are basically the ANSI 
equipment duty calculations, we do have an option for if you're overseas for IEC breaker duty calculations as a separate option. So if that's of interest of you, you could, could contact us about that. All right, so um, since we're running late, I think I'll probably not take any questions, but feel free to email me if you have any questions about the equipment duty, and hopefully this will help it make a little more sense. And maybe we'll do a later webinar and look at the medium voltage equipment. It's a little bit different. Uh, there's a couple of different other values we have to look at. But similar, similar concept. All right, well, thanks for your time, and hope you tune in again uh, for the next webinar next week. Thanks and goodbye.